Anyway, software testing. So, <clears throat> so far, you, we've been learning about topics that help us uh, with uh, making our res uh, research reproducible. And it ha has helped us making our code more reusable, better documented, and make our coding more effective. And this topic here that we'll learn today is no, no exception. It, it fits into the same framework. So software de testing is good for reproducibility, reusability, effectiveness, and so on. And hopefully this will become clear. So there were some prerequisites. You needed to have PyTest installed. I hope you already have this through your code refinery conda environment. You did receive, I think, instructions on installing optional testing frameworks because this lesson is now uh, offers the, the opportunity to write tests to exercise, to make exercises in different languages. And if, if you want to write tests, write, practice, um, writing tests in R or Julia or C++ or Fortran. There are some instructions on how to install the recommended or one possible uh, framework for testing uh, right here. But if you have PyTest, you will at least be able to do all the exercises in, in Python. Some Git knowledge is required. You, you already have that and a GitHub or GitLab account. Here's the, the structure again. I'll start with a motivation, go into some common concepts, show how we can test locally and yeah, uh, using PyTest. Then we have a type along where I will show you and you, hopefully everyone can type along how to automatize testing, how to make it happen without any manual work in the cloud using GitHub or GitLab. Uh, and finally, there will be this test design episode here where you can discuss tests with your colleagues and breakout rooms and also start writing tests in, in some language. How does that sound? Yeah. yeah, I could add one thing so that when we have the test design episode, then we will have, you will work in the regular breakout rooms. We will also have additional breakout rooms for the specific languages, so for Python and for C and for Fortran. Right, yeah. So if you have any like technical questions on a language, uh, like you, you run into some problem with your C++ test or something, you can visit the C++ room and ask a question there, hopefully. Let's see how that works. Good that you brought it up. So let's get started, motivation. So let's start uh, motivating testing. Why should you do it? And hopefully we walk away from this introduction feeling a need to write tests for our code. So here's a quote from actually another lesson uh, on testing in Python. Before relying on a new experimental device, an experimental scientist always establishes its accuracy. A new detector is calibrated when the scientist observes its response to known input signals the results of this calibration are compared against the expected response. This quote is actually cut short. Uh, there are two more sentences which are a little bit challenging. They're a little challenging. They, they say that uh, this the same thing should be done in, in software, and if you don't do it, you're doing you're not doing science. Maybe that's a harsh statement, but this is supposed to provoke some thoughts and uh, this analogy to calibrating detectors is not all that that bad because we should really keep simulations and analysis using software to the same standards as experimental scientists do with their measurements. If you need further motivation to, well, if you need something to keep you up at nights before you've tested all your code, you can have a look at two uh, studies here, or two articles about software problems that have led to High, high profile retractions because of some bugs in, in code. Uh, so we'll learn how to avoid these scenarios. So what, what do we mean? Well, maybe not everyone is familiar with what this even means, software testing, what does it mean? So here's an example. Uh, you see there are different tabs here for different languages. So I'll just keep to the Python version. We have a function 
here is a simple function, but we can imagine a more complicated function that converts temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius. We want to make sure that this function is correct. So we write another function, which has the same name except prefixed by test underscore. And this function tests the former function. It takes a known case. It no, one known case here is that if the temperature in Fahrenheit is 100, this function should return 37.777 Celsius. And then we make sure we make do an assert in Python. This depends on languages, how you do it. We make sure that the difference whoops, between the uh, expected result and the result we obtained is actually, we don't test that this is zero, this difference. We test that it's smaller than some small number. Why do we not compare all digits? Why don't we say assert that temp C is equal to expected result? It's, it's because of um, floating point precision in, uh, in, in, in computers. So you cannot represent any floating point number exactly. So you will never get two numbers to be identically uh, the same. We need some numerical tolerance here. Okay, so I will walk through a few advantages of testing. Some maybe are clear or expected. Some are maybe somewhat more subtle. And, um, and let's see what you think about it. So you may have experienced that as projects grow, it becomes easier to break things without noticing immediately. You might be implementing a new feature. It seems to work beautifully. But then when you start right, running something that used to work before, suddenly it doesn't. So this can happen. And, um, and as the more complicated the code is, the more easier it is generally to break things. I will just skip over. I will just take, bring out the most important things here. So testing helps us detect these early, uh, errors early. We need to test interpreted languages like Python, but also compiled languages. We care about reproducibility. So that's why we need to write tests. But here's a famous quote by a famous uh, computer scientist. Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. So that's something to keep in mind, of course. So, so I can add one thing here on reproducibility. Yeah. That's namely that a very common situation is that you develop a program on one computer. And uh, it's very good if you start to implement tests. And uh, this ensures that the program keeps, it, keeps its integrity over time when you add functionality. You can also have, use these tests when you deploy the program on other platforms. So compiling under another operating system or install, installing the program on another computer. Hmm. Because then the tests help you to tell you that, okay, now everything is up and running. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, yeah, it's, it helps users of your code, but it also help you, helps yourself when you're installing a program on a, on a new machine, for example. Uh, tests also help other developers. And by other developers, you may, we can also refer to our future selves. So tests can make it easier to refactor code. Refactor being, you know, when we rewrite it somehow, restructure the code without changing the functionality. And this is a sad fact that code can become unsustainable without runnable tests, and it can become legacy software, which is hardly usable anymore. It's easier for external developers to contribute to a project if, the, if it has tests. Because how, how can it be when you're testing, when you're trying to implement something in a big complicated code which doesn't have any tests, you don't know what effect it can have. You might need to suit up in protective gear like this person here. So anything can happen. If, if you don't have tests that, that make sure that what you've done doesn't break things, anything can happen. The code can explode. Here's maybe something that even if you knew about testing, you might not have thought about this fact, this, uh, this consequence of, of writing tests. So tests can actually help you manage complexity. 
And by complexity, we'll actually talk more about that this afternoon in the modular code development lesson. Um, so here is, here's a function. This function is pure. What does that mean? Uh, it means that it takes one, it takes an argument and it always returns the same result uniquely determined by the input argument. It does not depend on any external factors. It doesn't depend on, you know, environment variables or something happening in a different part of the code. Here is a function that does exactly the same thing. We don't need to go into details about the code itself. Uh, this is just, you know, you pass one argument to this function and it will always return the same result for the same argument. Here's a different version. Here we have some constants defined outside of the function itself. And this function does not return uh, temp C, it sets the value of a global uh, variable. So here we call it, we call this function below. So what can happen in this case? This function is not pure, it's impure because what result it returns or the effects, yeah. So what, what it, the effects of this function depends on something that is happening outside of the function itself. And this is difficult to test. So one consequence of, of this is that well-structured code, modular code, which is, has many pure functions is easy to test because you can more easily test pure functions. And conversely, badly structured code is difficult to test. So if you think about testing, if you implement tests early, it will guide you towards writing more modular code and less, yeah, you manage complexity in that way. So to make code more modular, maybe you could start thinking by how, how to make it testable and, and actually write the tests. It can guide you towards a, a more testable and more modular code. Good, so when is it not, when, when is it okay to not add tests? Of course, some things are just obviously correct, right? You, you're just plotting something or you're just doing something, a small script, whatever. Do you need to write tests? Well, it's not a one size fit all. There's maybe never, uh, there's, uh, we don't have a situation where you always have, have to write tests or, or never, so it can depend on circumstances. Maybe this is a discussion that you can revisit in a breakout room discussion with your colleagues. Uh, when, when is it overkill to write a test? Let's do that uh, if you have time in a breakout room later. Okay, so let's, let's go over to the next episode. Do you have any comments you want? Uh, no, um, not at this point. Let's, uh, let's go on to the next episode then. I click the next button, concepts. I'll uh, throw a lot of concepts at you now. You might be familiar with some or you might not be familiar with any, but hopefully some of these things will become clear. It's just a cartoon showing that even if you have tests, you can sort of, your tests might not be testing exactly what you think. Anyway, how to test. It's better to run imperfect tests frequently than to not have, than to have perfect tests which are never written or never run. So we should test frequently each commit or each push, and we will see how this can happen automatically in the cloud for us. With just a little bit of setup work, we can actually make it happen automatically. We should test with numerical tolerance, like I just talked about before. And we should probably think about code coverage. I'll come back to this. Defensive programming is a term, which means that you assume that mistakes will happen and you introduce guards against them. Two ways to deal with this is to use assertions. This will depend on the language, programming language, but in Python, you have assertions to make sure that things that shouldn't happen don't happen. Here, for example, we have a function that converts from Kelvin to Celsius. You pass it temperature in Kelvin. 
and physicists know that Kelvin should never be less than zero. Temperatures cannot, zero Kelvin is the lowest temperature possible. So you make an assertion. And then you can have exceptions for anomalous or exceptional conditions that require some special processing. Try except else in Python. Unit tests, this is important. We'll, you, you can practice unit tests later. So unit tests are, you, are test functions that test a small part of a code, typically a single function or a very small unit. So th th these are called unit tests. Then there are integration tests. Uh, they integration tests test a larger portion of the code, whether multiple modules are working well together, sort of like in a car assembly, where each component needs to be tested independently, as in unit tests, but the components also need to be tested together. So that's integration tests. Regression tests are similar to integration tests, except regression, it means, you know, going something gets worse over time. They off operate on the whole code base or a, a big part of the code. And rather than knowing the correct result, you assume you, you, yeah, you, you assume that past versions have been correct. And you just make sure that the code, if you implement something new, you don't get a different result than you used to get before. Test-driven development. It might sound paradoxical, but you can write the tests before writing code. Because often you know the result that a function is supposed to produce. You know what you want to Im implement. So why not just write the test first? You know, you test a function that doesn't yet exist. So you write the tests and then you, you write, write an empty function. This is the function that you want to implement. And you verify that the test fails. And then you write code, program, 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 until your test passes. So you write the test first, and then you actually implement, write the actual function. And when, when you make sure, when you know that the test passes, you can perhaps improve it, refactor the code until you're happy, and the tests are still passing, and then you move on. People actually adhere to this. Some, it's, uh, it, it may be suitable for some uh, situations. Continuous integration. Uh, this we will do type along. Uh, we'll see how to use uh, platforms like GitHub or GitLab. So continuous integration means that uh, you automatically test every single commit or push. So you, it, it's called continuous integration because we check whether the code integrates before integrating it. Code coverage, I mentioned it at the beginning. Um, it measures and documents which lines of code have been traversed, which lines have been covered during a test run. So, and it's actually possible to get a line by line coverage. You can see, you know, this file, like this source uh, file, 80% of the lines are tested or 100% are tested and so on. So there are platforms online which you can use and there's a real life example here. So this is just, again, throwing a concept at you that you might want to look into later. Of course, the total time to testing uh, matters. You cannot run a seven hour test every time you commit. So when you have, when you have implemented many tests, it can make sense, some of which are slow, perhaps. You might want to uh, identify some essential tests that run fast and cover enough of your code so that you can um, run it on every commit using continuous integration. And there are tools to do this, for example, in Python and using this PyTest framework, you can mark a function. So you can mark certain functions, like mark the fast tests, the essential tests, and, uh, and run only those. Okay. Tests don't guarantee correctness. Of course, you can have buggy tests as well. So all tests are happy in this case, but you're actually doing something wrong. So just, yeah, 
a, a word of caution. Testing frameworks. Uh, a very large number of different tools and frameworks exist for different languages. And we actually list some of these tools in the quick reference of this lesson. So if I go here, this is part of the same lesson. We have, uh, yeah, a number of, of libraries and tools that you can have a look at. PyTest is the one that we will uh, practice today. Some good practices. I mentioned before, test before committing or, or use, yeah, you can test uh, before committing and you can also test every commit. Fix broken tests immediately. Don't leave dirty dishes behind and don't deactivate tests temporarily. Think about the coverage. How many lines of your code are you testing and maybe physics or the science itself, how, diff how many different functionalities of your code are you testing? Uh, if something is expected to fail, you can test for that. Make sure that it fails in the right way or make sure that the code fails when it's supposed to fail. One can create benchmark calculations, benchmarking as in timing, making sure that uh, you don't have performance regression so that when you write something new, suddenly the code runs a hundred times slower. Make it easy to run your tests, like a single command or something like that. And make testing easy to analyze. Don't flood the screen with pages of output. Okay. This was a lot, uh, but we will now um, have a breakout session where you can practice a little bit. So I just skipped over to the next episode here, testing locally. What do we have in HackMD? Maybe it's time to pause a little. Yeah, just there are a few, there are many good points brought up in HackMD. So we could bring up a few of them now. If you, yeah. yeah. So uh, there's a commentary about um, integration and regression tests work uh, very well like examples of use it. Mm. So they also serve the purpose of documentation. And uh, one important question here, how do we test functions whose output is unknown to us? We know what they're supposed to do, but we don't know whether the result is correct or not. And this is a very open question. And uh, a general advice is that one can try to calculate it by other means. So that could be, and this has been um, suggested here in the answers, is that one can, for instance, see when you have um, particular results, if you have the input argument zero or have the input argument one, perhaps you can know right from the beginning what the output should be. It could also mm -hmm. be that if it is a mathematical function that you could calculate something with symbol algebraic means, and then you have that as a means to verify your numerical functionality. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think th th these were two important things. Uh, and we, we can get back to other points uh, later in the lesson. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not saying that testing is always easy. Definitely not. There are many cases where it's it's difficult to think of how you should test something. And maybe one thing that wasn't immediately obvious from my discussion here about the different concepts is that what do we recommend or what, what would be a good way to start testing your code? Should you start from the bottom up um, with unit tests, start with the smallest function, write tests, more and more and more tests until you've filled, if you haven't written any tests so far, or should you start with testing something more large scale as in uh, not just single functions, but maybe portions, uh, modules, how they work together. And maybe a good recommendation is that if you don't have any tests, a good place to start is something like an integration test or even an end-to-end -end test where you run the simulation, you run the calculation uh, from start to finish for a known case somehow, and, and you make that into a test case. You see, so, so testing the whole code at once. 
And I'm not sure if that's applicable maybe to the case you brought up, uh, Yuan. Uh, well, I would say in, for system, for programs that calculate something, we have some well-defined set of input and some well-defined set of output, then mm. those kind of integration tests are often applicable. Mm. If you have a program with, let's say, a graphical user interface and it is event-driven, then uh, the functionality to test is of a, of a different nature. So mm. then it might be that you need to, integration tests might be difficult to do in an exhaustive manner because there are so many ways that the program can choose to um, operate depending on, on what the user is doing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let's move into this exercise now. Unless there's something you really want to bring up, is there anything more? Uh, no, not at this point. Okay, we can come back to some, uh, have a discussion later as well. <clears throat> so this is the third episode, testing locally. Here you have a task, just to get started. This is somewhat straightforward. The instructions are here, step by step. It's to get you started with using PyTest and seeing how it runs, how how it works. So you create a new directory. Don't worry, there's no, no git here. You just create a new directory on your computers. You copy paste this code. Remember that there's a copy paste button here in the top right corner. Uh, copy paste it into a script or a file called example.py. And then you run it with PyTests. And you will see that the test passes. And then you break the tests just to see how that works. You do something wrong, you change the code, like, I don't know, you put a minus sign or plus one here or something. This is a trivial function, right? It adds two numbers or two objects in Python. Um, you can also add two strings. So somehow break this function so that your test function fails and have a look at the output. We are using PyTest because we need to have one tool for everyone now. In the future, you might be using a different tool, but often the principle is the same. There's also an optional exercise here. If you run through this very fast, you can have a look at the optional one, uh, which is to test with numerical tolerance. But now is a good time, I think, to open breakout rooms. So how are we on time? So I was planning a break from 40 minutes past to 50 minutes past. This doesn't need 50, full 15 minutes, I think. So <clears throat> if we take, uh, I think if we take 10 minutes for this, um, and then immediately afterwards a break. So if someone can update HackMD for me, so from 9.40 to 9.50 in Swedish time, there will be a break. So we can work on the exercise until then. Okay. Should I open the rooms now? Yes, please. Okay, I guess I'll walk through this exercise myself now for people that might be watching this on Twitch. So I will open up a terminal. The history is up here and what I'm typing is down there. So we start by creating a new directory and call it PyTest example. And I step into it, CD. We create an example.py file. I open up an editor. You can open up any editor of choice. Doesn't really matter. And here from the, from the lesson, I copy paste this bit block. Put it here. So here's the function add, and here's the test. Test underscore add. Actually, there was something I really didn't say, even though I should have, is that I'll try to say it when people are back from the breakout rooms later. Is that how does PyTest know what to do? I should have said that. Uh, it looks for all functions that start with test underscore. So test underscore is like a magic magic string, which is understood by PyTest to mean that I should run this. PyTest will not touch this one. 
it would only find these uh, functions that are called test underscore something and, and run those. Yeah, so this is a very practical aspect of PyStest because this means that you can add your test functions in the same source code file as where you have the functions yeah. themselves. Yeah. Distinguish them then with this test underscore. Yeah, that you can do, but you can also put them in a different file. Yes, certainly. Yeah. So that's flexible. Depends on how the structure of the code you can go both ways. So we run PyTests. And if we add a minus V flag, V is for verbose, meaning extra much extra output. PyTest minus V example dot Py. What happens? The test passes. It collected one item because there was only one function that started with test underscore and it ran it and it prints nice green output for me that it passed. Uh, we now break the tests. So, so we do A plus 2B instead. This is a bug. We let's pretend we accidentally introduced a bug and then we run our test suite. suite. So I test minus the example once again. Aha, uh -huh. then, then we realized that what, whatever we were doing, we actually managed to break the code. We introduced a bug and PyTest is rather explicit. It tells us that it fails like this. There was an assert statement, and, but assert statement gives an error. So eight is clearly not equal to five. This will give us an idea exactly of where to look. So we can go into test add, we can go into the code, look at the test add function and see where it fails and then get an idea of <clears throat> how to fix it. So this was, yeah, a small example just to get everyone started on, on using PyTest because we will do it type along in a minute. So there's one question from, from the HackMD. Mm -hmm. We can get back to that later also, but uh, the question is, can we use PyTest in Jupyter Notebook? And um, yes. Answer is yes. It is uh, certainly possible. Of course, you can um, import PyTest into your code, import PyTest, but you can also run it in, you know, you can run these uh, shell commands inside a Jupyter Notebook with exclamation mark. Well, exclamation mark Python minus V example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Diana, I think. Yes. We, yes, we we should just let people know when it's uh, nine forty. Uh, mm -hmm. But formally, break time starts. 10 minute break, but if people, I mean, we don't close the break up. So if you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Yeah, thanks. So yeah. everyone is back now. Okay. Good. I hope you had, uh, welcome back. I hope you had time to um, stretch your legs as well. And I hope you all managed to uh, try out PyTest. So this was. Um, Hopefully, as long as you had PyTest installed and so on, hopefully relatively straightforward. And we will now use PyTest in, the, in a type along session. Uh, we noticed something from HackMD. Uh, what was it, Yuan? Yeah, this is that um, if I have 0 0.1, point 0 0.2, then I will have, uh, the test will fail as opposed to originally because of the floating point precision. Yeah. Right. But if one goes to 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3, yeah. then fortuitously one will end up with identically 0 0.5. Right. 
And that's simply because of how floating point numbers are represented inside a computer. So sometimes this will work and sometimes not. So yeah. but bottom line is that you have to take this into account always. Okay, so let's jump to the next episode. I press the next button here. <clears throat> uh, maybe someone can copy paste into HackMD. Automated testing. Everything has been leading up to this point. Uh, we've done it manually. Now we want to see how to make it happen automatically. This is a type along and I will try to type out slowly. Uh, I cannot guarantee that this will work for everyone because you know you have different setups on, on your computers you might need to open up a text editor you know I'll, so if you don't manage to quite follow everything uh, you, there will be time later in the breakout room session to finish it perhaps but uh, let's see i hope if, if you can also just uh, sit down and relax and watch of course so that's optional so anyway so we will learn how to set up automatic, uh, automatic tests using one of two platforms. We have examples, instructions for both, GitHub Actions. We briefly saw GitHub Actions yesterday in the documentation lesson because you can use it to automatically build documentation for you. So Actions, it's uh, <clears throat> something you set up, something that should ha happen automatically at some point, for example, well, whenever a commit comes into a repository, something should happen automatically or whenever something else happens. There is a corresponding thing in, in GitLab called GitLab CI, CI for continuous integration. And other platforms like Bitbucket and so on, they have the same thing called something different. So this exercise can be run in collaborative mode. Like if you want to take this back to your colleagues and, and practice, you can instead follow the last optional episode called full cycle collaborative workflow. I can just click it. This is optional. It's the same exercise, except you do it in a circle. Like you, you fork and send pull requests with your colleagues, but I will not do that here. Um, so what we will do is to create a repository on GitHub. I will do it on GitHub. If you want to do it on GitLab instead, you can do that because you will see further below that there will be here instructions for both GitHub and GitLab. But I will have the GitHub tab open and, and follow those, do it on GitHub. I will commit code to the repository and set up tests with GitHub Actions. I will then find a, a bug in the repository and open an issue. We learned about that as well. It's very useful to use issues on GitHub or GitLab or similar for different purposes. For example, to write bug reports. We then fix the bug on a branch and send a pull request. And we see how wh what is happening behind the scenes with the te automatic testing. OK, step one, <clears throat> create a new repository on, on GitHub, in my case. Let's open up github.com, log in if you're not already logged in, and create a new repository. I have a green button. You can also go to the, uh, should I zoom in a bit? Problem is that, is this too small? Uh, because uh, if I zoom in, the plus button goes away and it doesn't look the same on everyone's computer. So you should have a plus button here at the top right corner. You can click new repository. I will click it. Create a new repository. I will be the owner. I will call the repository example hyphen CI. It will be a public repository and I will initialize it with a readme file. And remember what we did last week. So this is what you do if you want to initialize the repository on GitHub or GitLab. You don't have something already on your local computer. You're starting on GitHub. If 
the opposite case holds if you have something on your computer and you want to push it to to a, a web uh, repository, uh, web-based service like GitHub, you you create an empty. You don't tick any box here. You create an empty repository. But we create a readme file. And uh, then I press the green create repository button. Here we go. I'm going through the steps now. Uh, step two, clone the repository, add code, commit, and push. I will uh, clone this repository. For me, it's under this code tab here on the main page of the repository. You, if you have SSH keys set up, you, you go for SSH. I hope most of you have it, but you could otherwise use HTTPS. SSH, I copy this by pushing this button here. I then switch to my browser. Oh, sorry, my, my terminal. And I do git clone copy paste. I am in the wrong directory. I will first step out of it, cd dot dot. And then I put my git clone command. Okay, ls, here I have it. I will go into this directory. What does it have? It has a readme file, nothing else. So I am in step two still, I just cloned and I will copy paste, I can show you, uh, yeah, so here, I will copy paste this text here that should go into an example.py file. Clear my screen. So you will have to open up your favorite text editor. I do it like so using Emacs, example.py. And I paste the code. Oh, right, now is the right time to bring up what I forgot to tell you before, which was a bit silly. So what this is, looks like what we had before. So we had one function add, which adds two objects, A and B. And then we have another function called test underscore add. And what I failed to tell you before is that you run PyTests, example.py, and somehow PyTest knew to only run this function here. And how did it know? It's simply because this function starts with test underscore. So PyTest will ignore this function and any other function that doesn't start with test underscore. So it'll collect all the functions that start with test underscore and run only those. So this is the same now, this is the same script almost, except it has some more, it has another function subtract and something which is still commented out. We will uncomment this later. Okay, I save the file, go out, git status. I have one untracked file. So what do we do? We stage the file, git add ex example. And Yuan, if you think I'm going, if something is unclear or it's uh, too fast or something, too slow, it can be my... Uh... Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's going away. Yeah. It's status. I have one new file, so let's commit it. What should I, yeah. Git commit minus M adding add example script. Okay, I made one commit. Let's do a git log. I have two commits now. The initial commit and my new commit here. Q for quitting. Uh, okay, we push it now. 
how do we push git push origin that's the name of the remote the default name we haven't changed it and the main branch is called main i think it should be main for you too um if it's master you'll have to write master here but it should be main git push origin main okay this run without problems so so far you know exactly what has been happening we did this last week but now comes oops now comes the fun part so step three enable automated automated testing i will do it for github we select actions from our github repository page and we get to another page and there we uh, set up this workflow under Python application. It will look something like this. And GitHub Actions will then create automatically a new file for us, which will reside under a new directory called .github. So it's going to be hidden, hidden directory slash workflows. And everything will be set up. The file will be it will look like this. It'll have uh, some specifications, like what operating system it should run on, some name, what it uses, what Python version, what dependencies are required. So what is it? It, it will need uh, PyTest and Flake 8. Flake 8 is a linter. We don't need to dwell on that now. And then finally, at the bottom, it's, there's a, the run command to actually run the tests. And here we need to modify a little bit. So I go to GitHub and go to my repository. You see that I have now, I now have this example.py script file that I just committed. And I go to, uh, should I zoom in? I go to actions here. We are not going to publish a Python package. So you see that GitHub is suggesting these actions because it sees that this is a Python repository. It would look different for different source, uh, different languages. Python package, no. Python package using Anaconda, no. Python application, yes. We find the Python application workflow and we set it up. Set up this workflow, I click that button. And here is this configuration file that I was just telling you about. So it's a YML, a YAML file with some default name. We don't have to change anything. So you see that we're on GitHub, we're in this editing mode. We're editing a new file and we will then commit it. And you remember that we needed to change one line here at the very bottom, PyTest. So let's run instead PyTest example.py. This is the bottom, at the bottom of the file in line 36. We can now start committing. We push start commit. Green button. Uh, well, add testing action, test, act, test action, I don't know, something like that. Uh, I will just commit directly to the main branch. And uh, push again. It's very nice that all the buttons are green on GitHub. It makes you feel that you're doing the right thing. Commit new file. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you've been doing now can also be done for other languages with GitHub Actions. Indeed. Yeah. And then there are other templates than this uh, YAML file that, that you were showing. Yeah. So, what we're basically doing is to tell GitHub Actions how to configure a cloud instance, what packages need to be installed, and so on. So, we saw that Python needs to be installed and PyTest needs to be installed, and so on. 
And of course, if you have another language, then something else needs to be installed because these tests will not be running in the cloud. Okay. We added this file. What is the next step? I'll switch back to the lesson. We have already committed. Let's now ver verify that the tests have been automatically run. So I go here. Uh -huh. We have a green uh, little symbol here, which looks encouraging. So something ran correctly. What we can do is to go into the action tab here, click actions. And it tells me that one workflow has been run on this particular commit. I can click the commit. Okay, it shows me some information, state to success, total duration 23 seconds. This is just because it takes time to spin things up in the cloud. I can get even detailed output if I want by clicking build here. Uh, it, these are the steps of the workflow. So first it sets things up, blah, blah, blah. And then here we see that it tests with PyTest. And this output will now maybe be familiar with you. This is what we saw in the terminal basically before. So one test was run and it passed. Good. Yeah. So this um, action will now be performed every time you make a new commit. Right, yes. So it's the here in background to monitor how we develop the code and yeah. whether we introduce any things that break the code. Yeah. And I think we should go ahead and break the code. Yes. Like an excellent idea. So let's go to step five, add a test which reveals a problem. So I will go back to my terminal and just clear the screen. <clears throat> what do I need to do? I actually need to pull now. Yes. We made a commit on GitHub. So we added this uh, workflow file. So I will need to do a git pull origin main. And you see that it fetches one commit, which I didn't have locally. So now I open my example file again and go all the way down to this early previously commented uh, portion of the code which adds a new test. So this is a new test which, which tests the subtract function. Let's save it and go out. <coughs> Git status, this one is modified. Git add example, Git commit, Minus M, uncomment step five. Yes. And again, push it. And I will now immediately switch back to GitHub after pushing. Git push origin main. I will go to my repository and let's go here. You see that my commit is here. It's arrived online and what's happening? I will refresh the page. You see that there's a little yellow button here, yellow circle, which means that something is happening. Something is running. I'll refresh it, aha. Uh -huh. I get a red cross, something failed. Uh, you were test you were pushing uh, untested code to the main branch of the repository yeah yeah exactly we didn't run anything locally we just we just pushed something we hadn't tested yeah yeah okay so th this now seems to work like we wanted to work something it's a sanity check something is um, happening in the cloud maybe this is 
another proof that you should be working on branches and using pull requests. Yes. And actually, I'll do that now in order to fix this problem. But actually, maybe that's what we should have been doing from the beginning. We should have been adding new code on a branch. But anyway, let's say the main branch is not broken. We go to the issues tab. Um, did, did we look on the message for uh, no. how it was broken? Look on the actions. Enough. Yeah, let's go. So we see I, I clicked on the actions tab here. Uncover yeah. step five. I can have a look. The build, something happened there. Yep. So it gets, it fails. So it collected, collects two tests out of which one fails. So this test underscore subtract function is not working, assertion error. And here we really, like we saw, you know, in the breakout room before, it really tells us exactly what is not working. Good. Okay, so good practice is to go to the issues tab and click open up a new issue. So uh, test of subtract function now broken. And uh, where do I create a new issue? Here, submit new issue. So we're reporting this. Let's imagine we're working with some colleagues and now our colleagues have been informed there's a problem. Okay, so what's the next step? We added an issue. Now we want to fix the broken test. And let's now start following good practice. We, we made a new branch and fix the problem on a branch. So I go back to my terminal and we open up the example. No, let's first create a new branch. Git checkout minus B and I'll follow a convention, which is to use my name. Could be GitHub username slash, I don't know, bug fix. That's, it's a bug fix branch. I'll check out this branch, create it and check it out. Uh, now I open the example file. <clears throat> so this is debugging now. So we saw, we saw that our test revealed a problem and we now go into the code and, and aha, you know, based on the output, we see where the bug is. This was a bug and we fixed the bug. I save the file. It is. Add example. Hit commit minus M. Uh, there was some suggested. Oh, where was I? Some suggested. Uh, yeah. Hit uh, commit. So restore function it doesn't matter. Restore subtract function. But what maybe we want to do is to add this magic keyword fixes hash one because you might remember from last week we can refer to issues and pull requests because they are uniquely numbered on github mm. they get a unique identifier and our issue that we just created it was the very first issue so it gets number one but but now we are committing directly here so so i mean we have the chance to run pytest locally also yes uh, you're right we should have done that actually that's a good point of course PyTest example, yes, now we, we've fixed the problem. Of course, yeah, it's a good idea to run things locally too. We yeah. make sure that everything is working locally. Mm. But then working in a separate branch also then ensures that in case the bug fix is erroneous or if it's incompletely tested locally, it will then end up as a pull request in a separate branch. So it will not affect the, the, the trunk of the code. Yeah. So we really should, uh, th this, you know, it's hopefully a demonstration that we should be working on branches and letting the automated testing work on the branches before they get merged on GitHub. Using 
act, like a, a testing workflow, automated testing. So I wanted to write a commit message here, git commit minus m, restore function, subtract, fixes hash one. Uh, git log, here's my new commit. I will push it, git push. You might have set up, uh, configured your git so that you don't need explicitly origin branch name, but for good measure, you uh, will um, write out it in full. So git push origin and then the name of the branch. Here's something I use all the time. I think it's quite useful. So th th there's a direct link uh, from the Git output to actually create the, the pull requests. So this is the direct link to create the pull request, but let, let me instead go to the repository, click on the main page and see this box instead. So Thor, Thor bug fix had recent pushes and do you want to make a pull request? And I, I click that button. And I create the pull request. We should really be imagining this in a collaborative setting. So I, I do a type along, we all do it ourselves, but let's imagine that this is happening in a, in a collaborative setting. Okay, we now have a pull request and something is still happening. Some checks haven't completed yet. One in progress. So something will now soon happen. Okay, all checks have passed. So this is now we can see, this is a pull request that has come into a repository and we can immediately see, aha, all tests for this pull request have passed. Maybe this is what we should have done from the beginning before introducing the bug. Okay, so that's the punchline here. That's what we want to. Uh, that what that's what we want to see. We now see that the pull request is uh, is working. It's passing all the tests, and we merge it because it it's a good pull request. Confirm merge, and I can delete the branch after I've merged it. It's now merged as you see here. And what happens now to our issue? Is it still there? I press the issue tab and it's gone. There's one closed issue, zero open. And it's the one uh, I raised. And I can click that issue and see that it was automatically closed through a, oops, through a particular commit. Okay, so some of you hopefully typed along or at least you found it interesting, you found it clear. Uh, so this is something you can set up for your own repositories after you have implemented some tests. And that's the end of this type along. Um, of course, feel free to continue. I just want to summarize perhaps, or do, do you have any impressions uh, you want? Anything from HackMD to highlight? Yes, so um, it's brought up here is that um, <clears throat> when the actions fail, then uh, one will get email notification, which can be very useful. But it can also be a hassle if you get, if you have committed something which has very many bugs because you will get very many emails. Mm. And also when you are working with issues on, on uh, GitHub, uh, there will be notifications sent to help yep. you keep track on, on, on what on what happens with them. Yeah, I think by default you receive the emails, but you can also mute them if you want. Yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, so this was for Python, but the same workflow works for other languages. The workflow is also useful, well, particularly useful for col col collaborations and for people who work on the same code. And remember yes, uh, last week we learned about centralized and for forking workflows. This is equally applicable to both. 
And if you want to practice this with some friends or colleagues, you can have a look at the other version of this exercise where you do this collaboratively. Okay, so I think it's time now to actually go to the last part where there are breakout rooms, uh, as promised. So test design, this is the last episode before the conclusions. And the purpose here is for you to, I think, to begin with, discuss test design with your breakout room. You know, share your thoughts, how different code can be tested. Um, and you can even then uh, go start actually implementing the tests. And what does this contain? Uh, this contains, this episode contains all kinds of uh, code examples. So first we have a section on pure and impure functions, uh, fun number one to five. So one, two, three, four, five. These are different functions which will be either straightforward or difficult to, uh, to test. And you can discuss these. I would recommend that you maybe discuss these uh, pure and impure examples here. And then come some other ex exercises. So one example of a test-driven development process. So where the instructions are to write a function, yeah, well, to write a test before writing the function. And there's one suggestion to write a FISBUS. Like you want to implement FISBUS. Some of you might've heard about this. It's an algorithm, if you, if you like, which takes an integ integer. Uh, so, and for arguments, in integer arguments, which are multiples of three, the function should be returning fis. If it's a multiple of five, returning bus. If it's, an arg if it's a multiple of both three and five, return fis bus. Otherwise, return on the integer itself. And if you have non-integer arguments or integer arguments smaller than zero or, or, or zero, it should fail. So this is an exercise where you should write the test first before writing the actual function. And I would suggest if you have time, this is the one you can actually start coding on. And there, there's more, there's an exercise on testing randomness uh, with a few different languages. So this is a Yahtzee example. Probably you won't have time to go into this, but um, it's there for your future reference. You can have a look at this uh, to learn about how you can test randomness because of course randomness is, well, you maybe you could think it's uh, unpredictable. It's um, uh, what do you call it? In, uh, un, what, what do you call it? Not determinable. Well, you, but actually what you can uh, do with random number generators in different languages is to set a seed so the sequence of random numbers becomes predictable. And then finally, an example of an end-to-end -end test. But I don't wanna take more time. So I think you can discuss this in your groups. And the idea, like we mentioned before, is that you will be with the same group as usual. But if you have some language specific problem, um, you want to discuss some technicalities, how, how to do this in Fortran, how to do this in Julia or something, you can actually jump from your main room from your main breakout room to a language room to discuss with someone who has experience with that language, a helper. Of course, you, you're perfectly free to stay in, in your main breakout room too. Uh, is, that, um, is that clear? Yeah, I think it's clear. I will open all the rooms. Okay, and what? how much time do we have? So we have scheduled a break at 11.45. Uh, but there will be a 15 minute break, 11, uh, sorry, 10.45 to 11. So 15 minute break from 45 minutes past the hour. Of course you can, if you really, really want, work for five more minutes into the break, but we shouldn't forget to stand up and uh, get some oxygen and so on. So, but, uh, and, but this is the end of the testing um, lesson. You can have a look at the conclusions yourself if you want, there's nothing crucial that I have to bring up there. Uh, and at 11, we start with the modular code development, 11 CET. But now the breakout rooms will open. So until uh, quarter two. 
Uh, yes, but the, the breakout rooms will stay open. But the break formally starts at 45 minutes past hour. Just hope everyone got something out of this that you managed to discuss and maybe even write some code. Uh, many of the examples come with solutions, so you can uh, try it yourself at home and uh, yeah, see how you're doing compared to the solutions. <laughs>